Good evening, New Bedford Guide. Chris Resendi's back for the... John's got my show on his phone. He was told to put on silent. Uh, Chris Resendi's show. Thanks, John. You messed me up, buddy. Uh, tonight, we got a couple good guests. Um, John Oliver, school committee member. Uh, a lot of people are really anxious to see uh, award-winning superintendent Pia Durkin to go and to find out who her replacement will be. Uh, John and I will be sitting down for a little bit, talking about that. Uh, we also have a really uh, special guest tonight, uh, city resident Lisa Lima, who's uh, battling a form of kidney disease. Uh, Lisa is in need of a kidney. I'm hoping to bring a little bit of awareness. March is National Kidney Disease Awareness Month. And uh, we're hoping that somebody out there is going to help her. That'd be awesome. I'd love it, love it, love it. It's the ultimate, ultimate uh, sign of humanity. Giving up a body part to another human being to have them survive and live on to continue a happy life. Let's hope tonight brings that and uh, at least some awareness. If you can't help Lisa and you're not a match for Lisa, maybe you're a match for somebody else. And uh, maybe uh, we can help that person out tonight. Uh, during the previews, I actually... Saw a couple, uh, one, a friend, Kevin, who's a uh, recipient of a liver. And, uh, man, people out there that are surviving and living. I actually saw a video uh, come across my news feed today. Brandy, a uh, friend of ours, posted uh, someone who got a heart transplant. And the survivor got out of school, I mean, out of school, out of the uh, hospital. And the first person he wanted to meet was the father of this little girl that gave her heart to him. And uh, showed up with a stethoscope and uh, gave the father the stethoscope, tearing up, thinking about it. And uh, the father listened to the heart of, her, of his baby. So uh, this miracle. It's a miracle, you know. A little bit of his world is still alive. When she was gone, he still uh, got to hear her little heartbeat. It's amazing. It's a great, great, great thing. So tonight we're going to talk about that. On another note, Achiever of the Month. Manny and I will be announcing our Achiever of the Month next month. First, Achiever of the Month. Uh, she's a wonderful person. Wonderful young lady. I'm not going to give away who it is. She'll give it out. Uh, we'll give it out. Next Thursday, she'll be on. It'll be a surprise. Uh, her mom knows who it is. Um, I don't know if she's been told her yet, but I don't know if she does, who cares? As long as I want to keep it a surprise for the others. I do want to bring up, though, the sponsors that we've been able to gain. Uh, sheriff Tom Hodgson last week heard about the program while he was on with me. The sheriff has donated a gift card for every recipient this year. Thank you, Sheriff Hodgson. I'd like other politicians, local politicians, to uh, follow suit, please, and uh, give back to your community that you serve. These kids are extraordinary uh, kids who we're going to reward and recognize for doing something good in the community. And through this, we hope that other kids strive to be like our first Achiever of the Month, so that way, continuously, every single month, we have these kids striving to, you know, good deeds being done and... Hey, I want to be the Achiever of the Month on New Bedford Guide. Manny and Chris are doing awesome things. You know, A's before J's, uh, Achievers by Four, Achievers by Force, uh, New Bedford Guide, the Chris Rosendi Show, all of us getting together and, and really having kids aim to be a good citizen. Uh, I also want to bring up some of the other sponsors. Uh, Made Barbers, my friend Joey, cuts my little boy's hair. Uh, reached out to him if it's a male or female winner. Joey will give them a haircut. Uh, Steven and company reached out to my friend Sarah. She will be pampering uh, the winner with a haircut and package over at Steven Company in Dartmouth. And uh, Mario again, cask and pig, pasta house coming through. Uh, he's donating a uh, gift certificate so that winner can take their mom, dad, or somebody to a wonderful meal over at the cask and pig or pasta house. It'll be the winner's choice. We're also looking for other people in the community to donate. Anyone. Private citizens. Uh, businesses. I'd like to get these kids maybe a pair of sneakers. 
uh, you know, a cool little outfit or something or anything, you know, a gift card to Best Buy, you know, stuff that the kids like. So if you're out there and you're listening, folks, please consider donating to this cause, Achievers, uh, Achiever of the Month, New Bedford Guide, and uh, Manny DeBerto from A's, from A's, uh, A's Before J, excuse me, New Bedford uh, Elections Commissioner Manny DeBerto, that is, great guy. We're going to partner up and we're going to get this going. Without further ado, I uh, had John on in the past. He's a great guest and uh, animated guest, and he's very frank and honest, and that's why we love having him on tonight. We're here to discuss the search for the next New Bedford Public School Superintendent. Welcome, John. Hey, it's great to be back, Chris. It's been a while. Uh, yeah, a couple months. Uh, I think it was on just before I got sworn in in January. Yes, sir. It was... Uh, it was kind of a. It was a very rough January uh, and February uh, with issues going on, with no trespass orders still, and um, and that which it, it makes absolutely no sense. Uh, but you know, it is what it is. You're working on it, and you're at these meetings. Well, yeah, we're working on it. That's what. That's what's really funny is I can go to school committee meetings. I went to a conference with her and uh, uh, DeFalco in Worcester last couple weeks ago. Um, and everybody behaved. Uh, yeah, but you know, but at City Hall they hired a police officer to watch me uh, for uh, 45 minutes at a subcommittee on facilities meeting. So, uh, you know, it, it, it's it's pointless. It makes no sense, and it's a waste of the taxpayers' money. It's unfortunate that it is a big waste of taxpayers' it is. money, in my opinion. Um, but we have, we have important pressing things. Uh, yeah, in, I, I want to get into it. I was going to make a joke. You know, I'm still going to make a joke. How do you okay. feel about this? Uh, you were obviously, we know why you were elected. Yep. The main driving force of why you were elected was uh, your, your campaign platform was we're going to get Superintendent Durkin out. Right. And we're going to replace her with somebody. Uh, New Bedford guy just published an article where she uh, was just awarded. <laughs> I saw that. With a... Uh, Superintendent of the Year Award? Yeah, you know, and it was funny because at this conference a couple weeks ago, I, I actually, Josh Amaral was there with me, but we were sitting with the president of the Massachusetts Association of School Superintendents. Yes. Uh, and it was never mentioned to us, and, and of course, I'm, I'm sure he must have heard my name uh, from her. Um, and I was pretty, pretty, you know, my opinionated uh, on what was going on in New Bedford with him. Uh, and then to turn around and see this uh, leadership award, uh, you know, it's, that word is in, is in neither of their vocabularies, her or DeFalco. Uh, and so it just baffles me, and uh, I really hope it doesn't affect the award's value uh, in the future, but I, I certainly think it does after giving her a leadership uh, award. We had quite the uh, response on New Bedford guys. Uh, yeah, I, yeah. I think I posted the first, when I first saw it on one of the, I don't know if it was on New Bedford Guide or one of the other media outlets yeah. I saw it, and I posted, uh, you know, OMG, uh, yeah. you know, this isn't even in her vocabulary. It's almost like trolling, to be honest with you. It's kind of funny, actually, if you think about it, you know, all the animosity and the... Well, it'll be curious what's going to happen at the last school committee meeting, because I'm sure that they're going to, you know, the, the school committee members will have an outpouring of uh, cheerful goodbyes for her. Formal. Formal and uh, respectful. I guess that's what you can uh, all we can ask for at this point. Uh, Paul Santos has joined uh, New Bedford Guide. We've been doing a uh, four-part series. Yeah, and those have been fantastic. A lot of people have been uh, giving me good feedback on those, uh, and I've noticed you guys have been getting good feedback. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, those have been definitely beneficial, and they're beneficial, I think, certainly for me. Uh, you know, I'm not going to speak for any of the other committee members, uh, but, but they're certain, certainly... Uh, uh, beneficial for me to look at because it's just an, it's an other opportunity to see That's that what I person. was going to ask you. As a school committee member, was it a service that we provided here at New Bedford Guide to actually help you guys out at all? Did you notice that Paul's questions may affect the way you uh, take a look at these candidates and, hey, I didn't know that about them. Did you learn anything from Yeah, them? no, I did. And, you know, the one-on-one the -on -one that Paul does, uh, and Paul does a good interview, um, and so, you know, it, it certainly gives us, uh, you know, that candidate's uh, you know, perspective from questions that we may not be asking at the interviews. Yeah. We don't get a lot of time with the candidates. Uh, so anything like that is a huge help, uh, certainly for me. A lot of people aren't watching these uh, interviews that are going on. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how many people are watching. I don't even know if they've been posted yet uh, on cable access. Well, they're going, they're going, people, are, the attendance, let's say, is not there. The, the well, we had two. Uh, the first... 
on Monday, which was Dr. Girardi, I think we had somewhere maybe about a couple, 25, 30 people. That came and watched. That them. came. Yeah. Uh, Tuesday night, I knew that one was going to be heavily attended, local candidate, Heather Larkin, uh, and I was told somewhere between 100 to 150. Wow. More than I thought. It seems, I'm just going to bring it up because the New Bedford Police Department endorsed Heather. Yes. That's the first time they've ever done something like that, correct? As far as I know. What's behind that? Uh, do you find that it's politics at its best uh, or at its worst, however you want to look at it? Do you understand why the police would want to endorse a candidate? You know, I haven't point? had a, a chance to talk to uh, Josh Fernandez, the uh, school head school resource officer, about it yet. Yeah. Um, because I want this SRO's input too. I mean, they, they, they have absolutely. You know, they have. I don't know if anybody's bothered to ask them, but I certainly want to. Um, and so I need to ask ask them. I commend you for that because you know that they, they are an intricate part yeah. of the school system at this point. Um, so you know, it is. Um, you know, so the, so the police department does have a vested interest. Um, you know, in there, and I mean, because you know, we're having SROs, uh, you know, uh, being verbally assaulted. One case we had one assaulted. Um, the school department won't tell you that because they just hushed it up. But if you, so there is a there is an uh, was the student arrested for assault on a mm, police officer? Yes. So if you if you you know, I mean, and this is just looking on Facebook. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, but uh, you know, the administration will sit there and deny it to my face. And, and I, you know, I told uh, DeFalco and Durkin last school committee meeting that you know they they still work for us and their contract does uh, uh, have insubordination as uh, as a clause. And they're yeah. damn and they're damn close to it as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Just because they're resigning and they're leaving, you know, they still have a responsibility to to the school committee and the people of the city. Uh, and letting us know what is going on in our schools. Do the other members feel that way? Or is it just, are you just finding yourself the lone wolf here? You know, I really find myself, because when I do make mention of it, very rarely, I, I don't get very little backup. I do get a little bit of backup on this issue with Chris Cotter, um, but really not anybody else. You know, I, I, mean, I literally... guys came out in the past, not all of them, but some have said, you know, we're not really happy with her. And now it seems like that's all gone away now. Well, they aren't happy with her, but, you know, everybody's still, you know, very... I mean, I'm, you know, when I've seen her at, the, you know, at these conferences and stuff, you know, we've chit-chatted and I shook yeah. hands with the Falco, but, um, you know, clearly I, she's irrelevant to me. Um, you know, she's just got a contract and he has a contract to fulfill until they leave. Uh, and I expect them to do that to the letter, and that means being honest, and that's something that they have failed to do over the last four years. Now, as a um, school committee member, can you force them to bring upon any, uh, is there any, excuse my ignorance, is there any way you could force them to bring these things out, or is it... I would love to, to ask for an ad hoc committee to investigate what is going on um, and talk to principals, talk to teachers in a, in, in a legal forum mm -hmm. without superintendent or the deputy being present, uh, because we, I think we need to get hold of this, and we need to make sure we get it right so it doesn't happen again. That's my point of the question, is because I want to see everything come out now yeah. before the candidate, this, one of these four people, because they might have similarities to the current administration right. that you don't want to carry over. Right. Uh, and, and, that's, you know, and that's been a big concern. You know, already some of the candidates have thrown up some red flags to me, in regards to high stakes testing, yeah, um, Common Core, uh, which I think, as most people know, I am yeah, we spoke on this. I am against past. Common Core and, and the high stakes testing. As am I. Uh, so a couple candidates have put this, have already voiced their support of that, um, and and to me, you know, and they've also, you know, we've had one candidate that, uh, you know, lauded the mayor's leadership ability on the school committee, and, and I find that difficult to swallow. Um, These are the two that I've already interviewed that you're speaking of, right? Uh, or are you talking all four in general? Yeah, all four in general. Okay. Um, but, you know, we've had one candidate, you know, and, and you know, some, you know I, I have an issue with the leadership that the school committee's presented over the last several years. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, you know, well you sit there and, yeah. you, and you say, oh, that, you've done such a wonderful job with the school department. I, I don't see it. And a lot of the people in the city don't see it. Well, he's got to schmooze the mayor a little bit, too. So we got to maybe look yeah. at it, you know. So, well, you know, I mean, I'm, you know how I am. I mean, I'm going to tell you how I see it. Oh, uh, and that's why I'm going to ask you the next question. 
do you feel the cards are already uh, stacked for one one person in particular, or do, or do you feel that no. anybody's just there wasting their time? Right. Do you get that feeling? Everybody knows that I was upset with this search committee from day one uh, because it was appointed by the mayor. Mm -hmm. uh, you know that you know the chairman of the search committee never even appeared before the school committee. Never, I've never even met the mayor. I think that's pretty embarrassing for the school committee, uh, and, and I think that's. Uh, you know, completely uh, uh, the mayor, you know, just doing as he feels. So I, I do have issues. I have issues with the $27,000 that we spent on this search firm. If you saw what we got for $27,000, you, you would slap me upside the head. Is that something we could uh, request as a uh, public record? Yeah, we got, I can get copies of the contracts, and the mayor's office uh, has, should have copies of the contracts. Right, uh, but what we got for it wasn't worth it. Quick synopsis of what you got for it. Um, a, I don't know, maybe it was maybe a 10-page written report that I, uh, probably a, uh, an honor student, in high, senior in high school could have probably done or a freshman in college, um, and, wow. and some limited guidance on, uh, you know, how to ask questions and conduct the interview and, and about a 45-minute interview with each of the school the committee members, and they put together the... Um, uh, the input meetings that, you know, that they started advertising like four days before they started and, and they had a low turnout for them. Yeah. If you're just tuning in, uh, audience, we are speaking with uh, school committee member John Oliveira. We've already gotten into a little bit the search for the next New Bedford Public Schools superintendent. Uh, just wanted to let you guys know that I'm just tuning in. That's what the discussion is about. So, uh, yeah, we, go ahead, John. I'm we're sorry. We're now at, at the point where we got the four candidates a couple weeks ago. And, you know, the funny thing was we got the four candidates, and all we got was a little thing about where they went to college and, and where they're at now. And it wasn't – I had to ask at the next school committee meeting for their application packages. I had to ask for that. So the, none of that was provided prior? No. You know, and, and, and you know, so... Uh, so you answered my question. You, you kind of feel like the cards are stacked. I don't know if the card... I've been digging, because I've said it since day one. Well, you're the guy to ask. That's why I'm asking and, this question. You know, I'm looking, I'm looking. I, I thought it was one person, then I found out it wasn't. Because um, I, I flat out ask them when I do have one-on-one -on -one time with them. Yeah. Because uh, I, I don't think it's something I can legally ask at the interview. Uh, but one-on-one, -on -one, yeah, I'm going to ask you. Now... To me, uh, I don't know if this is true. It's been floated around there that one of the candidates was like a throw-in candidate. That's news to me. I haven't heard anything yeah. from the search committee. Only because she, the local ties, let's put it that way. That's why that person was thrown in. Well, we got a couple candidates with local ties. Yeah. And, and, of course, um, you know, that makes it difficult because we got, everybody knows those local candidates. So I get people that will throw out and say, well, I want to, I'd like to see this person as superintendent or this person. Yeah. And then I get people that write me the two page emails, which is fine. Keep, keep yeah. writing them. Awesome. But you know, they're usually very passionate about maybe one specific instance. Mm -hmm. So you, you know, you, you get those and you kind of got to look for a pattern of this going on yeah. because you know, it could be somebody that maybe they didn't get along. I don't get along with Durkin. Yeah. So <laughs> you and I spoke about this at the beginning before the show. Uh, here's my thing: uh, being the husband of an educator yep. as well, and I was quite frank with my wife about this. You know, we all have bosses, mm -hmm. and we all have a certain type of bosses, and you got to find <coughs> that boss in the middle. Right. You can't have your buddy being your boss yep. because that never ends up working right. out, and you can't have what we have now. No. Because so that doesn't yeah, work out. And not in an organization as big as... Yeah. So as we need someone who's going to respect their employees and basically put on some work boots, get down there with them. Absolutely, yeah. And, you know, well, you know, we've already been through this, but if the pendulum swings too far, yep. then we're going to be back here again. Right, and we don't want to do that. Um, you know, so there's a lot of things to look at, and, and that's breadth of experience. Um, one of the big things that voters said to me throughout the campaign and, and in the last few months... Um, people are people. A lot of people are upset about us continually bringing in outsiders into the city. Absolutely. Um, we've had two outside superintendents 
and they've both failed miserably. I understand that thought process, uh, but I don't think that a native at all in any job should take priority. I think the most qualified absolutely. person should take, you know, and then somebody with a vested interest in the city, we can take that into consideration. But I've never been a fan of uh, residence preference mm -hmm. in any job. Oh, yeah, and I, I have, yeah, but you know, th there is something that you have to look at when you're looking at the local person. 90% of the time, they are committed to the community. I understand that. And a lot of times, that's not what you have with an out of town candidate. Most of these candidates coming from out of town, you look at their resumes, and it's jumping from one job to the next. Yeah. Uh, the only commitment they have is to themselves. And at the end of the day, that's for the most part how right. most adults actually and have to process their work lives. You right. know, we have to commit. I have to, I make my decisions based on my family right. ultimately. You we know, have to understand yeah. that too, you know. And but people want to see the superintendent in the community. Um, so you yes. know if I want I want to, we, we talked about this in the past. I want you guys to like substitute teach at the, as a school committee member, go in and teach a class for a week. You know, be a substitute for yeah. a week. Not you because you can't at the moment. <laughs> but you know what I yeah, mean. No, like I want people that are making these decisions to actually sit and be a teacher for a week and actually see what goes on. And even if it's not a teacher, there are other positions in the school right. that they could actually take upon themselves. And I understand the school committee members are unpaid positions, but maybe offer a stipend. Maybe, you know, let's get people in there to actually see what's going on that are making these decisions, not just... Uh, let me listen to this one and let me listen to that well, one. Yeah, because at I, the end of the day, that really doesn't do Well, much. I think the school committee over the last several years has put theirself into that position by allowing the superintendent to control everything in the mayor. Yeah. And that's not, that's not the point of having the school committee. No. And what I've told the candidates that I've met, because um, you know, I said, what I am looking for in a superintendent is... I'm sure I'm not going to have someone who's that I'm going to be in love with and I'm going to agree with everything they say. And I don't think any of us are going to get that. Um, but at bare minimum, I want a superintendent that's going to be honest, upfront, and do what's right for the community, not what's right for them or for the state. Yeah. Um, and and that's and that's huge to me. Uh, is that that sense of honesty and being and for me to be able to sit down with them and have a conversation like you and I are doing? Yeah, uh, and you know, so we're having that opportunity. We're meeting with the candidates in the morning and then for lunch uh, and then afternoon coffee uh, for us to sit down with them for about a half hour, forty five minutes, uh, and, and kind of get a sense. And so, so that's something I'm I'm looking for at bare minimum. Uh, we need that, yeah. and I think the community expects that at this point. And the community does expect that, but I also think it's very me from the outside looking mm -hmm. in. Yeah, I mean, my wife's a teacher, so I guess it's not really too outside because I have a vested interest in this. But yeah. I want somebody, a leader, who's also going to be approachable. That's what they really need. Exactly. One of the main, main issues right. with this superintendent and this assistant uh, deputy superintendent, whatever his title is, they weren't very approachable. No. They made their they made their uh, their subordinates feel unliked, unwanted, unneeded, mm -hmm. and that's not that's not a good style. No. A good a good boss maintains right. his listen. I'm the boss. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, we got to play a game, and everybody has a yep. chair, and their chair is you know, this is where I'm at. Right. You're gonna have to respect me sooner or later. But be a person, be a human being, yeah. be effective. I don't really want to see the next superintendent. Because I don't think it's going to work out. We're going to be right back here mm -hmm. again. Be their buddy, though. R right. You can't. And I, my no, wife doesn't like that when I tell her that. But it's real life, man. You can't yeah. have a boss that's just your little... Your, no, you, know. you can't. And, the, you know, the big thing with that is the school committee has to stay on top of it. Yeah. Um, you know, and unfortunately, you know, I'm only one vote. And I can make all the noise at school committee meetings I can. Uh, but, you know, if nobody wants to come to my support or if the community doesn't want to come to my support... Uh, in, in these endeavors of, of holding people accountable, then it, things are going to stay the same. That's another part of the problem. Uh, you know, people, you know, thousands of people vote you in. Yeah. And thousands of people should be calling the other school committee well, members and saying, why aren't you siding with John and you right. know, doing the other stuff. One so the, if you agree out there with what John's saying, he's not getting support from the other members of the school committee at this point. That's what you're saying, right. correct? Call the other school committee members. Right. They uh, they work for you too. Yeah, show up at the show meetings. Show up at the meetings. Um, you know, if if you voted for this man, you voted for him for a reason. You felt that he was the necessary change. 
Some of you are happy you voted for him, and then there's going to be those that are yeah, unhappy. Are. That's fine. But if you're still happy and you still like his message, stand by him still. He needs your help. So, you know, it's being a stand, you know, just stand up. Uh, so we've got two more interviews to go. I'm looking forward to them. Um, and it looks like we're probably going to try to do a vote by Tuesday or, or no later than Wednesday of next week. So we'll have a new superintendent by the end of the week next week. By next Thursday we'll be, when I'm on, probably? Uh, yeah, and I think that, you know, the whole thing's kind of rushed. Uh, yeah, I'd say. That's yeah, why I, I don't know. I think it's really already think determined at this point, but that's you know, just me. But, you know, we're going to do the best we can. And I, I, you know, I'm going to tell people now, my people elected me or people that elected somebody else, it doesn't matter. Uh, people are going to complain no matter what. We aren't going to be able to satisfy everybody with the next pick and superintendent. Um, like I said, I'm looking for certain characteristics. Uh, I've put out my phone number, Facebook. You know, I'll put it out again, 508-264-8056. Call me, text me, hit me up on Facebook. Uh, I've been getting a ton of phone calls. Yeah. Um, I don't know if any of the other school committee members are, are being aggressive about getting their number out as I am, but I want to hear from people in the city. I want to hear from teachers. I want to hear from students. I want to hear from parents. Quickly. What's the ultimate decision on, like, who makes it? What's the process that we choose? Because a lot of people don't know that are watching this. Right. How, how this person gets hired. They go to these interviews. They do this. Ultimately, how does this decision get made? Once all the interviews are done, the school committee will probably sit down and we will discuss the different candidates that we may be supporting or alike. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, well, you know, my intention is to highlight some of the, the, their assets and, and some of the concerns I Absolutely. have with those candidates. Um, and from there, we're hoping, I think we're going to hopefully maybe, you know, vote it down to maybe two candidates. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, you know, we'll let it sit like maybe overnight and then, uh, come back the next day and, you know, hash it out a little bit more and then explain our vote. And so it's a vote majority rules yes. on. Yep. Yep. Four votes needed to, uh, uh, to appoint the new next superintendent. All right. Do you have any favorites so far? You don't have to tell me who it is, but do you have any favorites? I have two favorites. Good. Uh, well, that's all I, I don't want to. So, I don't want to show you cards yet. It's so, not fair to you for me to put you on the spot. Um, another part I wanted to really ask you during these interviews, for those that can't make it there. Yep. Quick description of what it, the process is. How many questions you're allowed to ask? Who's asking these questions and? The way um, it was done was we all submitted questions. Um, and then they, um, they uh, Josh Amaral compiled them all. Yep. And then the Monday night, we all met about an hour early, and we went through all the questions mm -hmm. that we had submitted, and we each ranked them uh, like 1 to 12. Mm -hmm. um, and those were the top 12 questions were the ones that we were going to ask the candidates, and the candidates get asked the same question. Uh, Follow-ups, obviously going to be a little bit different depending on the candidate's yeah. answer uh, or background. Uh, but the candidates all get the same 12 questions. We spend about anywhere from 5 to 10 minutes. The interviews run about an hour. They've been running about an hour and 45 minutes. And that's it. And that's it. And so, you know, it's, you know we're taking a lot of notes. We're listening a lot. Uh, you know, I talk to people before and after the event uh, here with, you know, get their input as well so now are you happy with this process what would you change about the process what would I, you like people your constituents would, to know that liked, keeps you happy yeah on? i would have liked to gone to been able to go to each can each candidate's district um i was i went to Volk. Uh, i would have liked to go into the other three districts so you did visit uh heather lock, heather lock with okay. josh amaral uh, I know Chris Cotter, I think, was in Randolph. Josh Amaral was somewhere else, too. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, we all went but to But you wanted places. to go to each one. I would have liked to go gone to each one um, and done that. I would have liked to have, when they announced the names, I would have liked to have the a packet. full packet yeah. uh, because we lost easily a week, week and a half of yeah. research time. Okay. Well, that's all I got for you, Mr. Uh, school Committee Member, yeah, so, stirrer, uh, stirrer of the pot. Next week, maybe we'll have some uh, well, good news. Uh, and, and next week's going to be another busy week because, we, you know, we have the, the uh, superintendent search. We have yeah. some budget hearings again next week. Uh, and then getting ready for uh, I'm not gonna the school committee meeting the following Monday. I'm not going to let you go without this one. Quickly, 
because we're up against the clock tonight. Yep. Josh has uh, made it well known. He's got to be somewhere. <laughs> and so he's going to kill me one of these nights. Uh, school security. Yeah. You're doing a budget. Do we have the money to place a resource officer at every single school in this city? I Is don't that believe you're so. It's not something that was even asked for. Uh, there are plans to enhance the perimeter security of the school. So armed security, a police officer, was not asked for this budget? No. After this last... No. Um, wow. You know, the, I, the, you know, we're in the process, like I said, they're, they're going to enhance the exterior security. Uh, one of my big things was I wanted to get students involved in this whole uh, shooter drill or, or what, you know, the Alice training. Yeah. And... Um, because to me, the more you train in it, the more automatic of a response. Because I don't know, maybe it's just one of those things the military does. Uh, you know, we train, we train, we get an audit. Police I'm officers. All about training, brother. Police officers, correctional officers, yeah. train, train, I'm train. All about training. Uh, what I'm the other members of the school right. committee looked looked at me and said, "Oh, we don't want to traumatize the children." Well, when it happens in your community, you're going to have a lot more trauma when they don't know what they're doing yeah, and what's yeah, going we'll on. Yeah, sick of this whole wind. We don't need trauma. And I'm really going to so, have to bring this up yep. soon so again. With that, that I can't believe that this isn't something that was brought up after, what, 16, 17 days after a horrible shooting. Yeah, the school committee was briefed on it, but there was no really, uh, in, the, in the proposed budget from the superintendent, uh, there was no security improvements. Zero security improvements in your New Bedford schools. Uh, Parents. That was part of this budget. That's part think, of this budget. Yeah. Ten days after we're removed from Parkland, and we have no call for more security in the budget. Just so you all know. But you know, one of the things too is we don't. You know, you don't want to have a. You know, I get three kids in the school. I mean, your wife works in the school. Oh, uh, we don't. Also, we obviously don't want knee jerk reactions. No. Too. Uh, I, don't think, I don't think asking for a police officer in each school is uh, a knee-jerk reaction. A lot of, a lot of communities have done knee-jerk reactions, and I'm glad we haven't gone that far. Um, right now, the schools are doing everything that they're going to do. Um, I think a lot of it needs to be left for the new superintendent to, to determine this. And some of the new superintendents have some uh, interesting concepts on security in the schools. Is that something you're asking? That's this? something I've been asking them, yes. Perfect. Anything else, John? No, I think that's about it. So. Uh, next week, uh, you know, if you want to have me back, or in a couple weeks, and we'll talk about the new superintendent and how uh, that vote went down. You got my number, man. You let me know, and I'm always up to letting We're good. everybody in the city know what's going on. Yeah. So. And so, and you're very candid and frank. So, folks out there, please give me a call. Uh, you know, let me know what you think uh, on superintendent. Uh, Say what you want about him, Mr. Uh, Oliveira is an honest and open individual who's not afraid to say how he feels, and. From what I know, every time I've called him, yeah, what do you need? And he does that with parents and uh, teachers as well. He's uh, the antithesis of what some of the other people are in this uh, nice way of putting it. And uh, he's, the, he's the guy. If you want the truth or you don't want icing on your cake and you just want the cake, ask him. He'll give it to you. John? Hey, Chris, thank you very much. You Once so again, much. it's been a pleasure I know pleasure you're going to run to a meet and I appreciate it. Yep. All right, great, and uh, good things uh, going on with your next guest. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm definitely gonna watch that after one. Yeah, so. she. Uh, we got a, we got, a, we got a tough one coming up, John. We got a great. tough one coming up. I try to keep my composure for the most part, but sometimes uh, the guests get me. John Oliveira, New Bedford School Committee member. Thank you very much, John, for your time. Uh, guys, I, I looked over at. Uh, my friend Jimmy, uh, Jamie Casey's uh, wall the other day, uh, and I noticed that he had posted a Heroes Wanted sign. Uh, right now, you can get some special EMT training provided for free to qualified uh, candidates. Uh, I got the flyer up on the screen right now. Uh, PACA has this up, and I'm sure we'll share it again on New Bedford Guide. I saw this, and I found the need to share this today. Uh, this is a career opportunity from here. You can probably move out to, uh, it's a 10-week program, 150 hours of instruction. I mean, gosh, this is uh, full-time employment starting at 33 $16 an hour in some places. Uh, you get your license. You get your certified training. There's even uh, transportation to and from training being offered in this. So please, if you qualify and you have a, someone in your family that wants to be a hero and uh, 
one of the toughest jobs I think around. Uh, they deserve more respect. EMT uh, Pack is doing this. Uh, looks like uh, Insight Youth Training Workforce Investment Board and New Direction South Coast are sponsoring this. Uh, again, Jamie Casey over at Pack posted this. And if you're in, if this is something that interests you, I would jump on it. Sean Fitzgerald also shared this. That's actually where I'm stealing this from and staring at it right now. I probably should have studied it a little more so I didn't have to look at it when I was uh, going over it. Uh, again, let me just review. Uh, people, if you're watching, uh, Achiever of the Month, next week starts. We have Sheriff Thomas Hodgson, who's already donated. Stephen and Company in Dartmouth, who's donated. Made Barbers in New Bedford. My buddy Joey over there already donated. Uh, my man Mario, who just continues to give back to the community. Pasta House. Cask and Pig has donated. If you would like to be a sponsor or help out with Achiever of the Month, feel free to contact us at New Bedford Guide. Chris at New Bedford Guide or uh, Manny DeBrito, New Bedford Elections Commissioner. You can contact him on uh, A's Before J's page on Facebook or uh, I'll get a message to him if you want to go through him. Without further ado, uh, we have New Bedford, lifelong New Bedford resident Lisa Lima. Uh, Lisa is uh, our guest tonight. And uh, she's got a, a need that we'd like to fulfill somehow tonight. And if you can't help her, maybe you can help out someone in her family or because it is a uh, inherent disease. Or maybe you can help out another person. Maybe it's not a kidney you can donate for National Kidney Disease Awareness Month. Maybe it's a liver or whatever. But we're going to hear to talk about National Kidney Disease Month, Disease Month, excuse me, with uh, Lisa Lima. Thank you. How are you, ma'am? Good. Lisa, give us a little story about your situation, when you were diagnosed, how you found out, what you have. Okay. I have a disease called polycystic kidney disease, which we'll call PKD. Um, I was actually diagnosed 20 years ago uh, when my mother got ill. I was pregnant with my daughter, and I happened to be mentioning to my doctor that she was starting dialysis. He asked me why. He looked it up and said, hey, that's hereditary. We better send you to get checked. So I went and got tested, found out I had it, but I've been symptom free for many years other than maybe having some infections. I have been hospitalized uh, with cyst ruptures, but you know, you're in for like a week and then you go back to your life and you don't really you think don't about it. Yeah. You don't really think about it. And I really want to raise awareness because you know, I'm mad at myself that I've known for 20 years that I had this, but it didn't really hit me in the face till May, when I actually started getting sick myself and really looking into, you know, um, and then it was kind of like, to, now I'm like at a moment where it's too late. I wish I knew ahead of time about what I needed to do, about what the end result was. I wish people had talked about that more because 75% of people with polycystic kidney disease are in renal failure by the time they're 50. I wish when I was... 25, somebody said, hey, you know, you really need to be thinking down the line because probably by the time you're 50, you're going to need a kidney. I had no idea. And you didn't prepare because you were unaware of... It's not really something that's spoken about. No, it's not. And your doctors didn't, like, hey, listen, you're going to need I've to start preparing same, for this? I've had the same, you know, no, not really. The, the awareness like that is not there. I think they deal with things as they come. But I think in illnesses that are long term, when you're not suffering from something, that's not discussed like that. I don't think they have the time to sit down and, with patients and discuss. I think they discuss the acute issues yes. and what we're going to do next. But not let's sit and have this whole conversation about what's going to happen in your life 25, 30 years from now and what you could be facing. Now, poly, uh, cystic kidney disease is what you have. Yes. It's uh, an inherited disease. Yes. And it's uh, clusters that develop in your kidneys, causing your kidneys to enlarge and lose mm -hmm. function over time. Yes. Now, is this something that you could have had a kidney transplant earlier in your life? Or you have to actually wait until failure at this point in order to get on the list? Unfortunately, you do have to wait until failure. And it's not only about getting on the list. It's insurance. It's, you know... You think it's simple, you're sick, and you're going to get something because you need it. No. I didn't actually find out till I went to the transplant team a few weeks ago that that was actually an interview. I thought when I had that appointment, wow, it's a guarantee, and I'm going to 
I'm going to get a transplant and I'm going to be put on the list. But I found out that's not necessarily true. So you actually interview... With a transplant team. To see if you qualify to get put on this list. Exactly. Oh, with seven people, you meet them and then they go and have a roundtable discussion. And all those doctors put in their input of whether or not they think you'd be a good a candidate or not a good candidate. The problem is there are more of a need than there are of organs. Yeah. Now, quickly, if I wanted to be a kidney donor, which we discussed why I can't be at this point, mm -hmm. what would I do? So you would go to a website called www.livingdonortufts.org because I am affiliated with Tufts. Uh, in Boston. Mm -hmm. That is where my transplant team is. And I've had, you know, we're lucky because I live here and we have the best medical care in the world in Boston. It's the truth. And I don't know if people realize that, but we really do have the best medical care in the world. And so I'm grateful for that. I'm lucky. And they really do work as a team. You don't have to, you know, you see one person, they've already spoken to the other person. I will say that about Tufts. It's been very, you see a lot of people, but they're very connected. You don't have to keep repeating the story. They already know when you get in there because they've already talked to the other doctor. Yeah. Um, and yeah, we do have a good it. network, uh, it seems like, because I've actually had to go from hospital to hospital. And it seems like our information shared pretty well across yes. the board with different physicians and facilities in this region. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't happen other places, so we're lucky. Now, we had brought up that this is an inherent disorder. Mm -hmm. uh, your mom... She's a recipient, you told me. Yes, my mom's. I've had an extra 20 years with my mom because somebody donated a kidney and a liver. Same person donated? Same person. Well, the same person has to donate a kidney and a liver when you need the whole liver because you need your liver to survive. Yeah. So, yes, she did get it from a deceased donor. You still in contact with that family? No, because, see, 20 years ago, we didn't get that contact. We didn't uh -huh. have the contact that you can have today. There was no network set up like that. Uh, I only knew that it was a young man that died in a motorcycle accident, but we, wouldn't get, we weren't given his name or any way to contact him. That's changed over the years, so that's nice that people can share, like the story you had mentioned. Yeah. Um, 20 so years, true. your 20 mom years. has gotten it. And now she's looking at you like, oh, my baby needs one. Because yep. no matter, my mom still calls me her baby. <laughs> my 200, I'm a 210 pound <laughs> infant, I guess. So she's looking at you and she's like, we need this for you now. Yes. And we're searching for you. But now comes the other tricky part that you told me. I just met Lisa prior to the show. We discussed a little stuff on Facebook through messaging. Your son has also been yes. diagnosed with PKD. Yes. Are you the same blood type? I don't know because we haven't tested him yet. Actually, I have three children, mm -hmm. and the doctor said actually not to test all the children right now only because, A, there's no cure. And they would actually be penalized, life insurance, things in the future, because now you have that mark on you that you have a disease, yeah. even if it's not bothering you yet. Unfortunately, he got an infection, and he got a bad infection, and because of his age, the doctor was like, something's not right. You know, Because why of what you're going through, yeah. I think we need to do it. So that's why my youngest son did get tested, and I know now that he does have it. Uh, the good news is if you don't get it, if not all three children have to get it. So if it does skip one, then their children don't get it. Because it's not like a cancer like gene a where, it's, where it skips generations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have to have it to pass it. So now, the reason why I brought this up is you brought up a, a conundrum. Do I try to find mine first or do I help my son get his? Because he's going to need one now. Mm -hmm. That's a horrible decision to have to really even not consider. Not really, as a mom. Oh, I get it. Trust me. I understand. I got little ones. I would jump in front of a truck at this moment's notice if I had to for them. And the mother, because they need her more than me. Uh, it's a hard... I, it's tough. I'm I sorry. No. <laughs> I wasn't going to cry, but... No, you can cry, ma'am. It's, it's, it's life. It's hard. And I think that, you know, when I, I told you I, that yeah. they sent me to Dana-Farber at one point after I had my son... And, you know, you love, the, you, you love your kids from the second you touch them. And that was my thing. I'm like, man, I just have my little boy. And yeah. now you, that's, I understand your feeling. Like, I need, yeah. you don't want to live for you no. anymore. You want to live for them. Yes. You know? And it's tough. Now, you did say the uh, Tufts, uh, livingdonortufts.org. 
sign up. And you're, what, what's your blood type? Uh, my blood type is A, um, but O is universal, so I can also take O. And like you had mentioned before, if not for me, there are so many people, so many people that not only need kidneys, need bone marrow, need simple things that it's just humanity, you know? It's so easy to be a hero and just step up. Yeah, I mean, my friend posted that today, and I'm actually going to look up what she said. It was, it was worded. It was a simple sentence, and she, and she hit it spot on yeah. on what donating an organ mm -hmm. is. Uh, and a lot of people aren't aware of living donation. A lot of people think that, you know, no, you, you have just to get die. organs yeah, no. when people die, but it's actually better for people to get organs when they're living. Um, the purest fresher, form of they're good they're, human Yes, life. you know, and you can't get anything better than that. And the success rate has been so much better, and they are lasting so much longer through living donation. So have you spoken with anybody who's donated their kidney or do you have any information from them like i want are they going to live a quality life after they donate one kidney yes because you can live fine with one kidney a lot of people are born with one kidney or people have kidney cancer and that kidney is taken out you only need one kidney to live it's not going to change their quality of life whatsoever the only thing that could happen is heaven forbid if somewhere down the future i mean what if you get kidney cancer and you donated your only kidney but how do we know that? Yeah, tomorrow's how do we know not that promised now? Tomorrow. to you. Exactly. Brandy Lucia says the purest form of good humanity is the story I, I talked about, about the guy that his daughter's heart and is another man. Mm -hmm. And if there's anyone out there that type A, type O, I don't know if you're religious, I am, pray on it. Uh, were you willing to do something for another human being, just a selfless act? Um, are there, like, uh, I don't know how to... So there are options. Are there, like, uh, not options, but are there a, a, a form of, like, a, a non-profit that will help these people that donate? Maybe yes. they can't financially afford yes. the burden to so, take a little bit of time out of work to do these kidney are, transplants. And I do have that information. So uh, as far as costs for medical, my insurance company would cover hospitalization, meds, any of that stuff. And then there are actual groups that come forward and help uh, people that help donate with like maybe their rent or their mortgage or the utility bills for the month. Is this something, say, okay, Chris Rosendis decides he's going to give you his kidney today. But Chris Rosendis has a mortgage, tuition for his kids' daycare and all that stuff. Is there a way that I can speak to these organizations prior to help me make this decision on whether or not I'm ready to donate my kidney. I do have the information at home, so we could I'd be certain, willing to look into that and see how that works. Because fairly, they have mm -hmm. to. You have to really think about that it's too. It's a lot. You know? Ultimately, I, I have I, thought. Yes. Gosh, I mean, I, I'd love to just say here is my, you know. Mm -hmm. But people have but lives. But you really they have, have bills, to. They have. I those get tears it. for your children are the same tears I cry too. Right. You know, so you and the people it. watching. So I just want to like bring everything out mm -hmm. to light. So you know, if someone's actually has it in their heart to, hey, I want, I think I want to help this lady tonight. You can do that now. There are resources is, out there. If yes. I said I want to give Lisa my kidney, yes, you can absolutely do that. Actually, as people have been going to the tough site, um, they ask you that: Do you want to give your organ for a certain person? What's that person's name? What's their date of birth? Are you willing to give it to anybody? There's also something called shared donation, where maybe my friend was willing to give me a kidney, but she doesn't match me. But maybe she matches another lady in Boston. Are you willing to give that person their kidney because their friend will give me theirs? Oh, so they if, do that if too. I had my aunt who yep. I was going to give a kidney to, but I'm a B. But you don't match, right? And she's an A, and you're an A, and mm -hmm. so we can do a little They'll ask crisscross. You, hey, do you mind? You were going to give your kidney anyway. What a connection that would be. So, it's amazing. What a connection that would be. And there's a lot, you know, there's the, what the family goes through, what the kids go through, the kids watching wow. me be sick. The same tears that you cry thinking about you not being around for your kids. Your kids are old enough where they're crying the same tears that their mom's not yes. going to be there. So. You know, I got five and two-year-old. My son probably understand it. My two-year-old's smart as heck. She might understand mm -hmm. it. Gosh, I can imagine them having to think about that, like. My mom's going until yeah. somebody helps her. 
and unfortunately there is dialysis and uh, yeah, we got it. it's not it's not pleasant it's not something that you know it's like a part-time job you're gonna go somewhere three times a week for four to six hours at a time and they're gonna drain all the blood out of your body clean it and put it back in you're not gonna feel wonderful after that is that something you could do uh, unfortunately it's something long I just, term it is something that you can do long term for years and years to survive However, you usually become sick with other things. Your body gets debilitated because it's, it's not a good system. Uh, I did just go a couple of weeks ago to try to have that put in so I could be ready for dialysis if I didn't get a transplant in time, and it failed. So I, didn't, I don't have dialysis access. So it's a little more urgent. So you do not have any? I do not have you access. You can't do the hemodialysis or the per I, I peritoneal? I could do the peritoneal. Yeah. However, the peritoneal, only 6% of people with kidney disease actually even do that. It's very difficult. You do it by yourself at home several times a day. you got to have equipment. you got to have a room dedicated to it, plumbing. I mean, it's a big... It's that's a, why most people don't do that. Yeah. It, it, it's a big lifestyle change. So, and at the present time, you're doing just the conservative management approach where you're just, you know... Mm -hmm. Your healthcare team tries to manage your symptoms and yes. all that stuff. And mm -hmm. that's it. That's all. That's, that's where it. we're at right now. That's where we're at. And right the now. next step is transplant. Oh, that's that. Oh, that's it. Because you cannot. She cannot get dialysis, folks. That's. Uh, so it's a it's a tough you know it's tough to swallow. Yeah. I also just survived thyroid cancer in the last three months. So it's been a it's been a busy uh, last year. Yeah, I talk to people and they got a ton of money and they're not healthy. Yeah. Money's not everything. Health is so important. Currently, there are over 93,000 people waiting for these transplants. Not just Lisa. 93,000 people waiting. That's a conservative number. We're talking five, ten year waits. Yeah. And it all depends, you know, based on blood, blood type, immune, uh, immunity system activity, and all this other, they factor in all kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. Yes. So if somebody has your blood type, that's not a given. That's no, right. no. Like I told you, I could be down. I'm an A or an O, and I can't give you my right. kidney right now, whether I wanted to or not. You know, there's certain things that you know. So you there's have a to lot of factors. Yes. There is. Guys, if there's anybody out there, and you find it in your heart to help this woman out, she has children. Think about that. Uh, kids want to see her. She wants to see her kids. We all know that feeling. I, I just want to be get, around just, for grandbabies. I just <laughs> choke up myself just thinking, man. Well, next thing, uh, every parent, we all have one thing in common. Like, we all talk politics on Facebook. Mm -hmm. The reason why I bring up Facebook is because this is what we hear. I usually have politicians on the show. I just had John on. I spoke with this on the sheriff the other day. Ultimately, we all have the same goals in life. We all want a healthy future for ourselves, for our families, to watch our children grow to give them opportunities to watch them succeed. We may choose different paths in life, and uh, but we all want to end up at the same place. If you have it in your heart or you know anybody that you may, hey, remember that time you talked about maybe you wanted to donate an organ? Here's your opportunity. We're gonna put the links down. We're gonna actually share this. Uh, we're gonna cut this tomorrow. I'm kind of busy, but I'm going to make sure I cut this segment tomorrow so we can repost it. I can have it, her post it, and she can share it. She needs a kidney, guys. She needs a kidney to survive. She needs a kidney to see her parent, uh, her mom, her kids, her, her future. It's that simple. There's a lot of people mention, chiming in. They're praying for you. Oh, good. I just wanted to mention one more thing to bring awareness to kidney disease, which I didn't find out myself till today doing research. Kidney disease kills more people than actually breast cancer and prostate cancer. But we talk about breast cancer all the time. Yes, we do. There's the Susan Coleman Foundation. I mean, I can think of things off the top of my head that are talked about all the time. And kidney disease is killing more people than both of those. And we're not talking about it. No. Nobody's talking about it. It's a shame. I just, I honestly, you reached out to us, and I said, "Wow, I got to jump on this right away." Um, and it's something we don't talk about. Everybody's wearing pink at football games, and mm -hmm. everybody loves their mom. That's why. Maybe that's what it is, you know. And uh, they found some cute marketing with, you know, yep. support the tatas and all that mm -hmm. stuff, you know. 
And I don't know why that this doesn't get the same. I, I, I see it, you know, I see what you're saying. Because it's something I was kind of oblivious to myself, you know. And I'm glad you reached out to us, and we're going to keep trying. We're going to keep running this. And Thank you. Anything you need from me, I promise you. That's whatever awesome. Whatever I can do. If you're having any type of fundraisers or anything, let us know. Uh, I yeah, that'd be great because financially, keep... I mean, it, it's devastating. It's horrible to have to work your whole life towards something and to have something just crumble before you in months because it's financially crazy. I mean, if you, if you have private insurance and you're a middle class working person. You're not a middle class anymore. It's. <laughs> you don't fall into middle class It's crazy. Anymore. You know, I have it. nine appointments next week. You know, nine doctor's appointments that all have co-pays. It's, it's crazy. It's crazy, devastating on so many levels. So many levels. So, Please, guys, a kidney, we'll put her back. The second she gets it, a little bit of uh, healing, and you'll be back in action. Oh, I'm, still in, I'm still plugging away and working. I, three jobs. Yeah, I work three jobs. I'm a, I'm a hard worker. I'm, I'm sick. I get up, and I keep going. Now, you take care of kids. Yes, I work with children who have been removed from their parents by DSS. I work at the Italian Home for Children in Freetown. And you've had a couple kids say, I want to try to figure out kids if I can give you... Kids throughout my life, yeah, that I've touched. You know, kids of my kids that have grown up in, in the house, have hung around uh, the, the community. The young kids that we have, they're just remarkable. They're remarkable. The kids at Vogue that have graduated with my kids who have reached out to me who I don't even know, who have reached out and gone to the website and donated. I mean, this youth is motivated. They're motivated. They're talking about things. And I'm just, I'm so grateful. Social and, media is great and bad at the same time. I yes. say it all the time. <laughs> it's the worst and the best all mixed in. And I wish we just had somewhere closer to the good stuff, but more to the middle, you know. Lisa, thank yeah. you so much. Thank you so much the for fan, having and me I missed on. You. And no, I, I just, you know, we just, everybody needs to be talking about it. I think the more we talk about it, I don't think p people realize there's clinical trials. There's things that everybody can be doing to, uh, I mean, how they found your medicine was because somebody yeah. took it and tried it and yeah. it worked and they said, okay, this works, let's market it. Yeah. If people don't do clinical trials, if we don't try things, if we don't make ourselves at some level, some type of guinea pig for the future, we're not going to know. Yeah. Kayla Madera. Love you, Mrs. Lima. <laughs> and then you have Leslie Rodericks chiming in. All positive thoughts. Tamara Nunes. Liana Lee. Goes Thanks, on guys. On. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. I pray Thanks for, for I'll pray me for you, and I, I'll continue to... I'm gonna, I promise I'm going to cut this. I'm going to share you the video so that way you can post it on your page okay. and we'll share it on the other groups and wherever else we can share it. That's awesome. Thank you. Uh, we got to get this out. Guys... If you find it in your heart or you know anybody, blood type A, and you want to give up your kidney, one of two, that you can perfectly live a normal life, try it out. It's the purest form of humanity, as Brandy put it. Uh, please, give this woman a chance to survive and live and watch her children grow and grandbabies and everyone else that loves her. She just wants what you want tomorrow. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Uh, I choke up. <laughs> Sorry about that. And uh, God bless you. Uh, Thank you. See you next Thursday. Uh, i got to get going. I'm going to start crying. So <laughs> I will uh, appreciate your viewership, everybody, and your Bedford guide. Uh, and as always, be kind to your neighbor and be super kind and donate a kidney if you can. God bless everyone. I'll see you next week.